start then? Yeah. Okay. Um, welcome everyone. Um, let me just briefly start out by saying that I sincerely hope that you and your loved ones are all safe and well. My name is Marie and I'm going to be the moderator today. Um, I'm currently an MSc student at SOAS doing a degree in international finance and development and I'm an active member of the Open Economics Forum and I'm one of the co-organizers behind this webinar series. Um, these are incredible, incredibly unpredictable times, which is why we created this webinar series to begin with, to kind of make sense of at least what is happening within the economy. Uh, it's organized by the SOAS Economics Department and uh, of the Open Economics Forum together. Um, the Open Economics Forum is a student society which aims to promote heterodoxy and pluralism, um, and we are a part of the Rethinking Economics Network. Um, I'm just going to do a brief round of thank yous to, first of all, to Anna Fricka from SOAS Marketing, then to Yanis de Firmus and uh, Sarah Silvano, two lecturers at SOAS who just caught this webinar idea and ran with it together with us. Um, and then to my fellow students, Alice, Alice Oli, uh, Daniela, Anna and Raza, who are all helping out behind the scenes uh, at the moment. And then some warm thoughts of solidarity to the people in my cohort who would have loved to take part in organizing these events, but for various reasons produced by the current crisis are prevented from doing so. And then a little housekeeping. Um, I'll stop talking really soon, uh, I swear. And then Daniela will take over and speak for approximately 30 minutes, probably. And then we're gonna move into a Q&A session. Um, for that Q&A session, we're going to need your uh, brilliant and, and not brilliant, just questions in general. Um, and you can post those in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. It's, I don't, it, there's only one chat box, so it should be fairly easy. Um, I've already posted some things in that chat box, uh, as you might see. Um, there's some social media info, which is on where you can follow the SOAS Economics and the Open Economics Forum, and also just get um, more info uh, on this webinar series as it develops um, and also there's a link to where you can find the previous recordings um, and this session is also recorded. If you're tweeting during this webinar we ask you to use the hashtag economics of, uh, economics of COVID. Um, right, this is already the seventh webinar in our series and uh, today we're taking on shadow banking in corona times. Um, the pro-cyclicality and insta instability produced by shadow banking is nothing new, but what happens when it's paired with a global pandemic and economic crisis? To give us her outlook and analysis of the current developments, we have with us leading expert in shadow banking, Professor Daniela Gabor. Daniela is a professor of economics and macrofinance at UWE Bristol. Uh, her research interests includes repo markets and their implication for monetary theory, central banking, sovereign bond markets and regulatory activity. She's currently working on two research projects. One is on managing shadow money funded by INET and the other is on the capital markets union funded by FEPS. She blogs at criticalfinance.org and at helicopter money and I would personally warmly recommend you to follow her on Twitter at Daniela Gabor. Um, thank you so, so much for joining us today, Daniela. The floor is all yours. Okay, um, first, uh, thank you for the invitation to the SOAS students and to my uh, colleagues uh, at SOAS. Uh, I don't know whether I'm a shadow banking expert, but I am definitely an academic who has spent a lot of time looking into the plumbing of global finance. Um, and I want to, I mean, I was advised not to have slides, but uh, I will have slides because uh, uh, I don't take advice uh, apparently seriously, and I'm, I'm not quite sure that uh, seeing my face would be uh, more exciting than looking at the slides. Um, so I want to make three points today to, to take away. Um, I want to first um, discuss uh, shadow banking in a historic, historical perspective uh, and to kind of move you away from the idea that shadow banking is some sort of obscure uh, uh, financial activity that happens away from the public eye and instead think of think about shadow banking uh, through its trajectory in historical time from what I would call the uh, illegitimate child of central bank independence from the 1970s, 1980s, demise of the Keynesian consensus of how we organize the relationship between monetary and fiscal policy to then uh, by the end, a global political project to um, create, to export the specific model of American financial capitalism 
all over the world and to uh, Americanize local financial systems. And I call this global political project, and I show you why I think it's a global political project. I call this the Wall Street consensus. Uh, the second point that I uh, want to make is that what we have seen with the um, coronavirus crisis, with the global pandemic, is a sort of generalized bailing out of, of shadow banking that to me demonstrates not only the political power of shadow financiers or elite financiers, but it also brings into uh, play, and it, I think it, we should study very carefully, a new role for the state. And I, I call this uh, this new imagine, this new type of uh, state activity that comes with the uh, growing importance of shadow banking. I call it uh, the de-risking state. And if you want to have a, an analogy with David Harvey's uh, accumulation by dispossession, I would argue that we are moving or we have moved over the, over the last 30 years into a strategy of accumulation by de-risking. And I'll show you what uh, this accu accumulation by uh, de-risking means. Uh, finally, uh, I want to make the, the, the third point, and I think this is the most important takeaway from um, uh, what is happening to shadow, shadow banking at the moment, is that the post-pandemic future will see a reinforcing of the status quo where shadow financiers are at the core of uh, global policy making. Uh, and we, what we I expect to happen for a variety of reasons is that global fi the global financial elite will uh, increasingly co-opt the green uh, uh, agenda and the sustainable development goals agenda uh, for its own sort of uh, profit making and accumulation purposes. I want to go through a couple of uh, quick definitions of what is shadow banking, um, just to uh, get them out of the way. I, I like Perry Merling's definition. Uh, so I don't know if you've seen the Zoltan Poshar's famous map from 2010 that showed that this very, very complicated uh, financial global financial system with lots of different types of financial institutions doing um, shadow banking. I think a, a much neater analytically definition is Perry Merling's money market funding of capital market lending. And why I like this definition, uh, why I think it's very neat, is because it uh, tells us that shadow banking is just another form of financial structure uh, that is now described as market-based finance. And in this market-based finance that I would oppose to bank-based finance, although I wouldn't take banks out of it, uh, market-based finance means credit creation via securities markets or bond markets or capital markets that is financed through new types of systemic liabilities or liquidity structures, uh, including uh, repo markets, derivative markets, and ETF, ETFs in, it, in the sort of latest uh, incarnation. And when I think about shadow banking in its or its equivalence to market-based finance, I think of an ecosystem of institutional investors asset manager, bond and, uh, and hedge funds, and of market-based banks that are operating together in a global dollar-based financial system. And this is why when, when we think about shadow banking, we should also think about, about setting it in the context of uh, financial globalization. Okay, and just to give you a couple of uh, big, uh, graphs of what this uh, financial globalization look, looks like, and to make a point uh, that when you read, or when I read the newspapers, uh, all sorts of articles that uh, are proclaiming the end of globalization as we know it, I think it's correct to say that real globalization, that is international trade in goods, goods and services, uh, has come under attack, but financial globalization is alive and well. And we already, we can see how important financial globalization is or has been uh, in um, before before the uh, pandemic times, and here you have the ratio of financial openness to to trade openness, and you will see that uh, cross border capital flows are much more important than international trade flows. And this is a figure from a, a report that I've written for the Heinrich Boll Foundation for, for the US, and I see Nancy Alexander is here. I want to uh, say hi to her. Uh, it's a report that looks at uh, frequently asked questions about financialization or about uh, financial capitalism. Um, so we have seen this uh, growing importance of um, uh, global finance. It is matched by uh, what Andy Halden uh, called the uh, age of asset management or the idea that we have uh, increasingly large pools of uh, wealth being managed by um, uh, asset managers like BlackRock or Vanguard, 
quite concentrated in in their management and uh, the the size of these pools increases uh, has increased very rapidly over time and I'll, I'll give you an account of why why this is important to think of uh, but when, when I think about shadow banking, I think about market-based banks and I think about asset managers uh, in particular. What shadow banking also does, and I think it's important to bear this in mind, is that it blurs the lines between what we tend to call uh, real money or patient investors and leveraged or speculative investors, uh, in, in a sense that we are seeing an overlapping of, of business models and uh, here, just to show you, um, because I'm a follower of Hyman Minsky, I wanted to show you balance sheets uh, in the sense that both real money investors and speculative investors, the categories that we tend to use when we talk about market finance, have on their asset side or on their, or on their liability side, uh, shadow banking or market-based finance activities. In other words, um, for example, uh, in figure six, what we, what we see is a what we would describe a typical shadow bank, financing its securities portfolio by issuing uh, different types of debt, particularly repurchase agreements, which are uh, uh, liabilities collateralized with these very securities that uh, this um, hedge fund, let's say, uh, is financing. And it's issuing, this hedge fund is issuing this type of repo liabilities to a real money investor, right? So we have repo lending here. Uh, or money market uh, financing or repo market uh, uh, financing of uh, securities market lending. Uh, also, very important to bear in mind that although in the shadow banking literature, we tend to separate uh, uh, real money investors from or pension funds from the more aggressive hedge funds, we actually know that in practice, a lot of hedge funds are managing the money of what we would call institutional investors or, or patient investors. And that's a graph here that shows you that um, institutional investors like uh, pension funds or sovereign wealth funds are uh, very significant uh, uh, lenders or investors in, in hedge funds. So how do we, did we get here? How, how do we come to live in a world uh, where uh, market-based finance is at the core or uh, is the sort of beating heart of, of financial globalization? And I want to spend a bit of time historicizing shadow banking as a political project, right? And I think one useful uh, picture of this uh, is this one that I found this morning on uh, through Google. Uh, I would argue that at its roots and at its beginnings in the current uh, uh, phase of financial globalization, and just to make a note that we've had this before 1933, before the first um, um, global financial crisis, uh, we have here what we have at the root of the growth of shadow banking in the last 30 years uh, are, um, in a sense, the political and economic ideas of uh, Milton Friedman and, and Margaret Thatcher. Uh, if we want to think that uh, Milton Friedman was an intellectual freedom fighter for Margaret Thatcher, he was, was also an institutional uh, fighter for uh, shadow banking. And what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean that in the first stage of shadow banking, so if we want to take a historical trajectory of how shadow banking evolved, shadow banking comes out of the, uh, the attempts to create an institutional separation between central banks and ministries of finance that were somehow joined at the hip during uh, Keynesian times in the sense that the central bank was uh, and monetary policy was subordinated one way or another to um, the uh, Ministry of Finance and its role was to keep uh, uh, financing costs low. When this institutional separation occurs, what we see uh, is the rise of shadow banking through the uh, what I call a liquidity imperative. In other words, um, ministries of finance, first in the US, uh, increasingly allowed uh, repo markets to be organized by private market participants according to the rules that they preferred. And this um, uh, logic was that as long as you have ministries of finance that can issue debt or securities, government bonds, uh, and allow private financial institutions to finance the debt securities through uh, repo markets, then uh, the sovereign doesn't need to worry about liquidity. And if the sovereign doesn't worry about liquidity, it, eventually uh, it doesn't need to worry so much about the volatility in, in financing costs. And this repo US treasury model, which is at the beginning of shadow, shadow banking in the sense that it creates uh, uh, shadow financing markets, was ported to uh, Europe in the 1990s 
uh, in some uh, sense through quite interesting political battles in, in Germany or the UK. I don't have time to go into them, but I'm happy to, uh, to take questions. But we are seeing the spread of shadow, shadow markets in the 1990s uh, as a consequence of uh, many um, ministries of finance all over the Europe trying to solve the conundrum of what do you do uh, if you don't have a cent if you have a central bank in the, uh, that is independent and that is no longer providing what Milton Friedman described as one of the most problematic aspects of uh, macroeconomic management, which is a, a monetary financing for a populist governments. So that is the, the first stage where we see the growth of uh, shadow financing markets all over Europe. And then in stage two, uh, shadow banking continues to be a political project in the sense that its growth is fed by a series of what I would call neoliberal assaults on the old traditional uh, welfare state. Uh, the, the more we have a week of the ability of the state to tax multinational corporations or to tax high net worth individuals, the more we have a weakening of the welfare state's ability to, pro to promise to take care of uh, future uncertainties through um, public goods like health uh, or education, the more shadow banking we have in the sense that we uh, middle class uh, um, individuals in high income countries are starting to um, uh, save through um, uh, pension funds and insurance companies. And these will become what uh, Zoltan Poshar calls institutional cash pools which are uh, those actors in, uh, in the shadow banking universe who uh, want or, or who, uh, for whom the traditional banking system doesn't work um, anymore in the sense that it cannot pr produce money like uh, instruments like bank deposits that are functional for them. And therefore shadow banking comes in uh, and produces these uh, uh, instruments while at the same time financing uh, aggressive leverage from hedge funds and other um, uh, high risk, high return uh, types of financial institutions. Uh, this, I would guess uh, that this is a, a story of shadow banking uh, from the mid 1990s up to the collapse of Lehman Brothers. And what is interesting about the collapse of Lehman Brothers is that we have a sort of narrative break in the way that uh, pol policy um, uh, circles all over Europe uh, or, and in the US uh, think about shadow banking. For, for quite a while, we had shadow banking as a source of diversification. Uh, what we have now is a source of systemic crisis because for many um, uh, financial, many uh, regulators rated the crisis of Lehman Brothers as a run on systemic shadow liabilities, particularly a run on the repo market. And what we, we have out of the collapse of uh, Lehman Brothers is on the one hand, an attempt uh, to regulate shadow markets like securitization markets and, and repo markets through the Financial Stability Board, but these attempts become increasingly watered down and weakened by, uh, I would say, I would argue the the lobbying power of uh, of uh, private finance, as much as by the entanglements between monetary and fiscal policy that shadow banking creates. Uh, it's uh, stage one sort of historical origins. And then uh, we have a stronger attempt to regulate shadow banking through uh, Basel III regulations that are targeting the leverage and liquidity cycles that are produced by the shadow uh, banking activities of uh, commercial banks or, or market-based uh, banks. However, this, uh, this, this period of treating shadow banking as a systemic uh, part of the finance, financial universe that needs to be properly regulated doesn't last very long. And by 2015, we have an, what I would uh, describe as the contours of a global political project to push for market-based finance uh, and to transform the Financial Stability Board says, oh, we have to transform uh, shadow banking into resilient market-based finance, and we have to think about liquidity very carefully. Uh, then we have uh, the G20 project of infrastructure as an asset class and the local currency bond market uh, project that both are arguing that we need to put in place the kind of Americanized financial structures uh, that are characteristic to, to shadow banking in order to make sure that uh, developing and poor countries uh, can finance their infrastructure projects and in order to reduce the dependency of developing and poor countries on, on dollar debt. And, uh, and that I will show you in a second is, is a very elusive idea. Uh, that by uh, shifting into local currency bond markets, you reduce dependency on, on dollar debt, but it's, so, uh, it's a very powerful narrative. 
Uh, it also comes into the global development space with the World Bank, who in 2015-16 introduces the Maximizing Finance for Development Agenda, which again is a project of uh, creating an institutional framework under which uh, development interventions can uh, increasingly rely on uh, shadow banking or, or shadow financial institutions in order to achieve the sustainable development uh, goals. And this project, I would argue, has been quite successful. Um, if I don't know if you this is too small to look at, uh, from a World Bank and IMF 2020 um, report on local currency bond markets, what we are seeing here is is that although we talk a lot about the dollar debt of poor and uh, emerging countries, uh, what matters in terms of relative distribution is a local currency uh, debt. And uh, local currency debt issued by uh, emerging countries is quite significant as a share of GDP and as, and as a share of total, 86% um, in, in this uh, table. But what also matters on this uh, right-hand side is that uh, the local currency bonds are increasingly held by uh, non-resident investors. In other words, by these global institutional investors that we tend to think of as a, a part of the global shadow banking universe. So, uh, in finishing with the first point, uh, the argument of, of the first point is to trace historically the, the growth of shadow, uh, shadow banking as a, as a uh, political project uh, of financial globalization that involves trying to emerge local financial systems to make them look increasingly like the U.S. Uh, financial um, architecture that allows uh, global institutional investors in the shadow banking universe to take positions across a set of currencies and across, of, uh, across a set of uh, asset markets uh, in order to uh, generate profitability. Now, what happened in uh, the global, uh, with, a, with a pandemic, I would argue that when we think about the re responses of uh, uh, various high-income countries to and, and emerging countries to the global pandemic, we are seeing the contours of a de-risking state. That is a state that assumes uh, institutionally the responsibility for reducing the uh, exposure of shadow banking to the kind of procyclical forces that Marie was mentioning in the, in the beginning. In other words, making financial, bailing out financial capitalism and uh, in a sort of asymmetric way in which uh, um, I think can very well be described by uh, heads, uh, you will, I lose um, in terms of the relationship between the state and, and shadow banking. And what does the state de-risk when it de-risks for financiers? And I think there are Two, uh, three very important category, analytical categories that we can think of in terms of uh, state de risking. First, um, um, there are raised hands. Marie, do you want me to uh, stop and talk about this? or? Um, no, I think if the people who have questions could just ask them in the chat box, then we'll get to that afterwards. Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry, eager <laughs> participant, but uh, I've been told to take this at the end. So uh, the, the, the first analytical category of de-risking is the, uh, the state de-risks collateral uh, uh, in order to de-risk systemic liabilities, right? And uh, in 2008, we have seen or that it, I think it's very um, legitimate to describe as a crisis of shadow banking. We see the state de-risking in a sort of covert way, uh, is through a new um, institutional form, which is a market maker of last resort, that basically puts a floor on the prices of uh, certain uh, collateral securities in order to make sure that the um, liabilities or the debt that is collateralized with those uh, securities does not become, uh, does not explode into a cycle of financial instability. And here, of course, um, the more the more uh, remarkable uh, role of market maker of last resort can be thought for government bonds, but also for a, a range of uh, market based uh, sorry uh, mortgage uh, and asset backed uh, securities. With the pandemic, what we are seeing, what we have seen over the last um, three months, is a normalization of this market maker of last resort for a broad range of assets across high income countries and developing countries. And to me, this is quite interesting in the sense that. If you uh, look at the U.S. Federal Reserve, see there that the Federal Reserve is now purchasing a very broad range of, of uh, securities, 
uh, including using Bla BlackRock, which is, I would guess, the most important systemic shadow bank that we have at the moment, using BlackRock in order to de-risk, for example, uh, uh, ETFs or exchange trade traded funds. But what we're also seeing that is interesting for developing countries is that uh, central banks in, say, Colombia or South Africa or Chile um, are increasingly committed uh, or accepting that they have to de-risk government bonds for uh, institutional investors that are uh, uh, non-resident. So we are seeing a normalization of this market maker of last resort, which was very difficult during uh, the first uh, crisis of uh, shadow banking in 2008, because it exposes the way in which uh, the uh, government debt is not only an instrument for fiscal policy, but it's it's also a fundamental safe for the shadow banking universe. But it's not a safe asset that is immune to shadow banking uh, volatility. And we, and if you want to read more about this, I would just recommend uh, reading Nathan Tankus's work on the Federal Reserve. He, uh, Reserve has a series of really interesting blogs. And he knows a lot more about the market making of last resort in the US than, than I do. But what we know uh, and is interesting to study in terms of shadow banking is uh, how uh, our pre-pandemic ideas about who is safe from the procyclicality and potential liquidity spirals that the banking generates. We thought before 2020 that at least the US sovereign is safe. Uh, in the sense that uh, we, you don't get the destabilizing dynamics uh, that require uh, uh, the central bank to intervene in collateral markets and stabilize their price. We don't see these destabilizing dynamics um, occurring in government bond market. Uh, and that is now true for Germany for a very specific uh, set of circumstances that have to do with the architecture of the Eurozone. And here you see that, in a sense, when you, the Eurozone is doing bad, and there are financial pressures, everybody runs into Germany. So it has a sort of de facto exorbitant privilege that comes from the architect of the uh, Eurozone uh, macrofinancial uh, uh, system that the US no longer has, uh, or, or the US no longer has on, uh, on what we thought or unquestionable basis. And here uh, uh, there is a graph that shows how hedge fund positions before, to before uh, COVID-19 led to uh, disruptions in the U.S. Treasury market, in my mind, are very uh, closely related to how uh, to the mechanics through which shadow banking generates liquidity and uh, leverage cycles. Uh, but the state doesn't only de-risk collateral for financiers who are uh, um, making uh, or, or making profits through uh, market-based finance. What we are seeing, and I think this is really interesting to study, is that the state is, in is increasingly oriented towards de-risking exchange rates for uh, global financiers. And when we talk about, uh, in general, about exchange rates uh, in relationship to central banks, we tend to think about the global do dollar financial cycle, which is, a, in a sense, the brainchild of Helen Ray's work. Uh, and that basically says uh, that uh, the glo what financial globalization does is to integrate and to connect more and more um, local financial systems to the dynamics of uh, the global dollar funding conditions that are ultimately a sort of a result of the interactions between the U.S. Federal Reserve interest rate decisions and uh, the uh, trading and market making positions of um, U.S. based uh, uh, banks and, and dealers. Um, so uh, exchange rates become uh, important in, in this global dollar fi financial cycle in the sense that they uh, have um, an important influence on what happens not only with uh, the dollar liabilities of non-US banks, uh, but they they also matter through the growing importance of this international FX swap market. Uh, for Borio et al., the, the FX swap market uh, uh, is a important story of missing dollar debt uh, that is equivalent in some ways to the story of uh, other shadow markets like, like the repo market. I have some disagreements there, but uh, I don't think we have time to go to go through them. But what we see in terms of institutional reactions to the importance of the global dollar financial cycle and to the importance of to the growing importance of local financial systems being inserted directly or indirect, indirectly through the FX swap market in the global, global dollar financial cycle 
is that the central central banks in in emerging and and, and poor countries are assuming uh, uh, exchange rate risk one way or, or another and there is some research from brazil that sh that shows that uh, the bank of, the central bank of brazil assumes a role of hedger of last resort in a sense uh, uh, takes over or provides hedging to local banks with us dollar liabilities or to or the risk exchange rate for non resident holders of of local currency bonds and I will show you why this matters. This is from a, 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 an article from by uh, Martin Wolf, uh, picking up on some work done by Hyung Sun Chin and others at the Bank for International Settlements, that shows that in a sense, although uh, developing countries were promised that if they Americanize their local financial systems and move towards market-based finance by issuing local currency bonds, uh, they will be they will be better protected from the uh, volatility of the global dollar financial cycle. That's not the case because um, uh, the positions of institutional investors in these local bond markets very much don't exchange rate dynamics. And when uh, the exchange rate threatens to depreciate, you will have a, a run for the, for exit simply because um, uh, gains will be. Uh, Will be the gains for institutional investors would otherwise be um, eradicated. So we are seeing this um, uh, shift towards uh, central banks de-risking as a hedger of last resort, but we're also seeing a newfound willingness from the U.S. Federal Reserve to backstop the global shadow banking system uh, through two types of um, um, a sort of uh, lender of last resort uh, facilities. Uh, and there is here an interesting uh, question of the hierarchy of access to the U.S. Federal Reserve, because we know that the, Fed, the U.S. Federal Reserve is prepared to treat central banks as uh, peers in the sense of lending uh, U.S. dollars to them in swap operations, and then those U.S. dollars are, uh, uh, are used by um, uh, the central banks to sort of prop up the dollar balance sheets of uh, their uh, local uh, banks and, and shadow banks. Uh, but we're also, but so that's that's sort of the first layer of hier the hierarchy of access, but we're also seeing um, a sort of second layer where the US Federal Reserve says, okay, uh, I understand that your local financial system has dollar uh, liquidity needs, but I'm not going to provide uh, you with uh, dollars through swaps. What I'm going to do is I'm going to allow you to repo your uh, uh, holdings of uh, US treasuries uh, and get liquidity this way. And we can have a longer conversation about what, the, what, are the, what is the implication of this hierarchy of access to the US Federal Reserve in terms of the um, resilience of um, uh, emerging countries to the global dollar financial cycle. Uh, what I think matters, taking a step back, is to, to take into account or to think uh, in terms of the institutional changes that are occurring in the world of central banking in the sense of uh, de-risking exchange rates. And that, that I think will become more and more uh, normalized as we go along. Uh, the third analytical category of the, uh, the of the risky of the de-risking state that I think is term is to, uh, important to take into account, and where I think we will be heading once uh, the sort of more acute phase of the global pandemic is over, uh, is uh, a, a, a de-risking agenda for new asset cl classes. And I'm talking about green finance and uh, sustainable finance. In other words, uh, we are going to see, I think, a very clear uh, dominance of the status quo that we had before the pandemic. I think some of us were uh, initially somewhat optimistic at, at the uh, beginning of the pandemic to see some sort of a silver lining in in this unprecedented, in many ways, uh, uh, global economic crisis, because we thought that the status quo of financial globalization will, will be dismantled, and then there will be opportunities for something uh, that progressives would find nicer uh, to come in place, some form of a big state that can, uh, in a sense, protect us from uh, not only from pandemics, but from the climate crisis. And I think that we were a bit um, um, naive, at, at least I would, I would argue that I was naive to assume that this would be the case. Instead, what we are going to see is a, a strengthening and a reinforcing of the structural drivers of uh, shadow banking and financial globalization, which I'm treating more or less as, as the same phenomena, 
uh, with new asset markets being developed with the help of the state uh, in uh, green finance and in the sustainable development goals. And I've written a little bit about this, uh, that I think of this global political project as the, the Wall Street consensus. And you can find the, the contours of this global political project if you're uh, bored enough like I am to read the communiques of the G20 or the very dry prose of the World Bank when it talks about fi maximizing finance for development. And the logic of this um, uh, Wall Street consensus is to say that institutional investors uh, in particular that I've shown you at the beginning are sitting on trillions of US dollars would very much like to mainstream and to move away from sort of impact investment into uh, uh, rendering their entire balance sheet uh, sustainable, into greening their balance sheet, and into participate and and in participating in in achieving the sustainable development goals. And how do we do that in a world where uh, there are limited fiscal resources? Well, we can turn sustainability into a profitable business, right? Just we have to think through what are the mechanisms through which we can ensure that we can attract institutional investors' money. Uh, into local uh, bond markets, uh, and by this, uh, when when uh, we talk about local bond markets in this context, is uh, local green uh, uh, bond markets or local SDG markets. Uh, and there are two important uh, sort of mechanisms through which the the Wall Street consensus, that is a sort of five six year old political project, global political project before uh, the, the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, First, the de-risking state is very important. It comes uh, and, and it works together with the multilateral development banks. And the idea is that uh, institutional investors would like to, to get involved in more sustainable uh, markets, but they need, to, they need to have the right risk return profile because their mandates sometimes are limiting. And to uh, de-risk these new SDG asset classes, uh, the state can take an important role by assuming particular types of uh, of risk, and uh, very important because of the narrative of uh, financial uh, of uh, uh, fiscal constraints. Most of the uh, projects that are coming or that are being proposed for creating investable SDG assets will be created through public-private partnerships. That is, uh, the public and the private sector are coming together uh, to work out how, for example, a highway can be financed, can be can be constructed, financed, and then put into into use. Uh, and PPPs typically commodify what we think of uh, public goods in the sense that a PPP in uh, health means a, a hospital that will charge user fees, uh, that will charge fees for for health in infra in. Uh, a road infrastructure, it means a highway that will charge user fees. In energy infrastructure, it means a, a, an energy sector that uh, uh, increases um, um, energy costs uh, or uh, takes or, or removes caps on, on energy costs. Uh, and uh, PPPs have a very specific and peculiar uh, risk structure attached to them. And there is a lot of work being done on making sure that some of the risks uh, in, in PPPs are assumed by uh, the state. And I can give you examples of that uh, when, if I have time. The second leg of this uh, Wall Street consensus is a, a leg of, of Americanizing uh, local financial systems. And it says, well, in order to create investable SDG assets or, or investable green assets, you have to make sure that uh, your financial system can welcome these institutional investors. In other words, you have to make your financial system look like the US financial system. And I thought I'll just give you a couple of uh, pictures of um, uh, how active uh, this uh, uh, Wall Street consensus narrative has been uh, over the last two months here uh, from one uh, shadow uh, actor, uh, Euroclear, that discusses how Ghana uh, is making very important steps towards uh, Americanizing its local financial system, towards creating what we would call uh, the plumbing of, of market-based finance. The same from a Financial Times article today, uh, talking about the convergence in infrastructure and uh, sustainable investments through the ESG framework. And I'll come back to the ESG framework in a second. But I guess the punchline of this uh, last sort of part uh, and of the question of where we are, we are heading to uh, heading to is that the post-pandemic 
uh, post after the pandemic, we will see. Uh, this is my my projection, but I'm an economist, so I, it may will it will be very wrong. It may be very wrong. Uh, is that the, we'll see a Wall Street consensus on steroids in the sense that a very large increases in public debt associated with uh, the pandemic will make PPPs even more att uh, attractive as uh, strategies for uh, post-pandemic recovery in the sense of promising to uh, generate large infrastructure pro uh, projects that are going to put a lot of state uh, or fiscal resources on the line. So that's a promise that is quite empty, but, but in, in political terms, I think that's a very important uh, promise. And in high income countries, we, we have already seen calls for uh, green recoveries. And I think these green recoveries will be very much led by uh, shadow banking or by uh, private finance. And I wanted to just show you a, a, a figure from the IPCC draft report for 2020, um, which to my mind summarizes quite well how powerful uh, the Wall Street consensus is in, um, let's call them technocratic circles that are discussing climate change and the solutions to climate change. And what you see here is a vision of dealing with the climate crisis by uh, uh, making shadow banking uh, as the, m the most important private actor in delivering on uh, climate, uh, in, in the, on the climate ambitions. And what you have there, of course, is the kind of financial instruments uh, that we, are, we know from, uh, or we are familiar with from shadow banking. This is, remember, we define shadow banking as, as market-based finance. And you see here bonds, uh, green bonds, securitization, uh, being uh, identified as the types of uh, uh, financial mar uh, market instruments that uh, should be promoted in order to uh, deal with the climate crisis. And you see here the language of risk and liquidity that I described earlier. Uh, and uh, I, I would say quite, uh, quite uh, positively put in the sense of risk transfers to the private sector. But what uh, the IPCC draft report uh, recommends is pr uh, public private, private partnerships where the risk transfers that are really relevant are the ones that are coming from uh, the private sector to the to the state. I want to spend a bit more time thinking about why why the what what do we what how will we get green recoveries uh, and why do I think that they are uh, going to be finance led? Just quickly, yeah. I'm I'm giving you three more minutes because we have yeah. a couple of questions as well. Oh, I have two more slides. Uh, okay. Uh, sure. Uh, very good. So um, we know from the climate debates around, uh, that we've had just before the pandemic uh, that the controversial issues are in terms of uh, sort of shadow banking meets uh, the climate crisis have to do with how do we decide what is uh, green and what is brown or how do we green uh, shadow banking and uh, market-based finance and that's a question of who decides uh, what are the rules for uh, identifying green, and that's the discussion of taxonomy, and then who decides how these uh, taxonomies uh, will be uh, used in order to green the financial system. And what the Wall Street climate consensus says, and this is where I think we will get a, a finance-led uh, sort of green recovery, and I'm using quotation marks, I would say a finance-led greenwashed uh, recovery, is that increasingly we are seeing that uh, it is Wall Street that is pushing for its own preferred version of uh, of uh, identifying green and brown, and that's through uh, the ESG rating system. I won't spend too much time on it, but uh, it's very clear to me by following, for example, the the uh, policy involvement of BlackRock that ESG will become the private taxonomy that is being used to rate financial instruments for their sustainability and greenness. And it's a very unreliable uh, 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 taxonomy. And it opens the door to a very significant amount of greenwashing. Uh, there is an article in the Financial Times today that makes exactly this point. And why this matters, uh, I think, and why the future uh, of uh, the post-pandemic future will be, in a sense, uh, a shadow banking future is that the state, uh, because of the uh, narrative of austerity that I think is already sort of taking, uh, accelerating its, in, in its pace and in its uh, political um, just we will see the state uh, trying to encourage and subsidize uh, greenwashing. 
uh, and uh, subsidize uh, 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 green financial instruments. In other words, uh, de risk both brown assets because it doesn't identify them as brown, but also de risk uh, green assets by incorporating in the central bank's uh, sort of policy uh, toolkit various uh, preferential and um, uh, treatment of, uh, of uh, uh, green based. Uh, um, or green financial uh, instruments. So I'm going to finish by saying that I'm a, a bit skeptical about our uh, polit about the political um, uh, context and momentum for thinking through the implications of shadow banking for the post-pandemic uh, world. What I expect to see is a lot more uh, both SDG and greenwashing with a cost socialized through uh, the balance sheet of of the state and through fiscal policy one way or another. Uh, and in order to think about how do would we po politically mobilize to, to fight against the system, we have to think about the political power, uh, political order that underpins shadow banking. And there is a lot of political power there and structural power. Uh, there is a lot of ideological uh, resistance to removing the independence of the central bank and a lot of ideological uh, aversion to, <clears throat> to big state that I don't think um, we have overcome this easily, but okay, I'll stop, Marie. Apologies to you and your <laughs> sense of timing. No worries. Um, it's actually I let you go a bit over time because we only have four questions uh, that come in for now, um, uh -huh. so I'll let people ask questions for a little longer if they want to. Um, but we have two questions that are kind of um, touching upon uh, the Wall Street consensus mm -hmm. and. So one is from Peter Andreas, who is asking um, if you can mention what you consider to be the greatest threat to national development agendas for this approach, this approach being blended finance PPP for reaching SDGs. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the greatest uh, threats to development financing? Um, mm -hmm. To develop financing, uh, and can this approach be altered for greater or more sustainable development impact? And then Carla is asking um, about the increase of shadow banking in emerging markets. Um, mm -hmm. If these around capital controls um, could be enough to limit capital flight or institutional investors of institutional investors, um, or would that only erase any incentive of those to get involved in the first place? And what mm -hmm. other policies would we have to push for? Okay, so let me. Yeah. Take these two. Uh, I would. I think, in a sense, if we think about. Uh, okay, so the first question was on the greatest threat to national development agendas that comes from the rise of of the Wall Street consensus, and I think there are uh, a couple of um, things to take into account. If we if we think about the trajectory of the developmental state uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, successful mental states, in a sense, had an ideological component and a uh, structural component. And the, the ideological component was an elite that could propose a national development strategy that involved typically industrialization and going up um, global value chains or, or value-added uh, exports. So it could propose a, uh, uh, an, uh, an, uh, sort of project of, in ideological terms, of a project of uh, development uh, that had some uh, purchase within uh, the with, with a local economic and political elite. So that's the the ideological. The structural part had to do with the with the technocratic capacity of um, the uh, state to implement the kind of uh, national development strategies that were pro that were proposed by this uh, by the political elite and what we are seeing with the wall street consensus is a reimagining of the role of the state where uh, there is not much ideological work being done besides arguing that, okay, the state, we, we need infrastructure, poor countries need infrastructure, to, uh, infrastructure cannot be financed by um, very limited and very constrained budgets of uh, poor countries and of emerging countries. I guess now we can argue that you, you can make a persuasive argument that any, any uh, country has a constrained budget because of the impact of, of COVID. Um, and uh, with this logic that you can you can do things with the private sector as long as you do some de-risking, uh, what 
uh, to me, the, the greatest threat is that it's very difficult to propose a counter narrative that, in a sense, legitimizes a, uh, a green developmental state, right? Or legitimizes uh, a green new deal of uh, economic discourses because uh, it would require uh, countries all over the world to basically articulate a vision of uh, greening their economy and greening the financial system that goes both against the structural constraints of, of fiscal policy and the ideological constraints that come from the political power of um, uh, carbon financiers. So in a sense, the more Wall Street consensus we have, the, the less space for a green developmental state uh, we have. And, and that is a, con that is a con it's an interesting story to, to trace because obviously uh, different countries will have different trajectories and uh, different uh, domestic polities will have different political struggles. But if I look from Nigeria to Peru to Indonesia to Egypt, uh, dif very different countries where the Wall Street consensus is already quite powerful uh, in, in sort of mobilizing local political support, uh, it tells me that trying to fight against this pervasive narrative that with the help of institutional investors, uh, we can solve development uh, problems uh, much easier than otherwise, it's a very difficult narrative to resist. So I'm, 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 I think it closes down uh, developmental space in, in ways that are far more technocratic and far more uh, sort of obscure than we are used to, because you have to be able to deconstruct the, the problems behind a narrative of maximizing finance for development that requires you to spend, uh, I don't know, like me, 30 minutes ex explaining what, what is wrong with local currency bond markets. Uh, aren't they great because you don't borrow in US dollars? Uh, then uh, increase of shadow banking in, in developing countries. Uh, and uh, how do we address these? I think that's another I, sort of uh, discursive bind that we uh, progressive economists find ourselves uh, confronted with. And, and that is because uh, the, the, the story of bringing shadow banking into your local financial system uh, is, is a very positive story of bringing institutional investors that are patient uh, and that want just a little bit of liquidity and just a little bit of de-risking to provide you with the financing that you're requiring in order to um, develop sustainably. That is a narrative that is difficult to fight because the alternative uh, that is uh, that is usually uh, proposed is, okay, then do you want all these developing countries to borrow in US dollars? We know that is a very bad idea. Um, uh, or the alternative is, uh, and, and the progressive alternative would be to say, well, we need to go back to the old days of the developmental state and a very repressed financial system. So there is a lot of argumentative work to be done and, and we are not there. And how do I know we are not there even remotely? Uh, and I, I think uh, Cristina Lascarides, uh, Lascarides, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, uh, uh, touched upon the uh, last week is the, the very puzzling absence of capital controls in the COVID pandemic. Uh, very few countries have resorted to capital controls. Uh, even Turkey, that is notoriously sort of averse to capital controls, but also notoriously uh, vulnerable to very complex fin uh, financial dynamics. Nobody is using capital controls. And to me, this is a, a reading of the political mood in, in developing and emerging countries towards uh, reimagining uh, the role of the state as a developmental state. So I would, I would say uh, what we are going, the fact that capital controls are not on the table for countries that have been very severely affected uh, by uh, the pandemic. And instead of capital controls, what we what we have seen in action is the, the, the risking state, right? So the central bank doesn't say, I'm going to stop non-resident investors from uh, exiting my government bond markets. Instead, uh, central banks uh, with capital controls, instead central banks are saying, I'm going to de-risk my local government bond market for institutional investors by putting a floor on the price of, uh, uh, of these uh, securities. So I think the, to, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about the possibility or the political uh, appetite for a very strong re-regulation of, of shadow banking. All right, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to some questions um, 
well, kind of um, developing this, but in uh -huh. more, more specifically policy related. Um, and there's one from Owen Lewis who says, Carol, Carolyn Sissico recently wrote uh -huh. about dangers of issuing too much safe debt, which she writes leads to investment famine. Um, mm -hmm. If I'm understanding your fantastic presentation correctly, does the necessary backstopping of shadow banking liquidity create a permanent situation of investment famine? And then there's another question from Brian Kim, who interestingly asks, um, what would be the consequence uh, of Larry Fink issuing the orders, orders to the Fed and the EU Commission, and how will it benefit from and direct the bailouts? Um, you might think in those, those lanes. Um, and I'm going to have to ask you to only to answer those questions in three or four minutes, if possible. Okay, so let me let me just say that uh, yes, uh, Caroline is uh, uh, Sissoko's uh, point about too much safe debt is in a way um, uh, very similar to the arguments that I'm making about the de-risking state in the sense that, and I think she she argued the same, uh, that uh, we have a political economy of shadow banking or of market-based finance where there is the, 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 the risking actions of the state are creating too much safe debt in the sense that they are completely altering the risk return profile for, uh, for market-based finance. And this altering of risk return profiles is not one that is benefiting me as a pensioner, right? Because my, my, although I am a de facto a lender to the uh, shadow banking universe simply by uh, having uh, contributions to the pension fund, um, we have seen that pension fund, uh, the, the owners of um, pension assets like myself or pension contributors, we are all also being squeezed at our end by um, what I would call, I don't know, I think uh, the lead financiers uh, is, is a pro in, in some ways a, a, a difficult category or a problematic category because uh, it, it sounds uh, quite shadowy, but there is, there is a, a class uh, uh, aspect to this that um, a couple of colleagues wrote about recently. There is a class politics to aspect to shadow banking that has to do with the political power and the structural power of, of global financiers, and it's not benefiting people like you and me. Whether this will create an investment, an investment famine, I am not quite sure that I agree with Caroline, but I haven't thought through enough through it. I think it is fair to say that there is a push for uh, commodifying more and more uh, uh, public goods and that, the, that what we think of, um, in, the, in a sense, capital investment may or may not be restricted by the, the growth of shadow banking. I'm, I'm not convinced that necessarily the growth of shadow banking goes hand in, in hand with a, an investment famine, but it, it does certainly distort what we would think are uh, signals about uh, investment uh, and fundamentals that are coming from uh, securities prices. Uh, and I will, I will, I think I will stop at that. But maybe uh, uh, Caroline, she's my colleague at UWE. Maybe we could uh, have a webinar where take, we're discussing this further. Uh, and then uh, the question about uh, Larry uh, Fink and and the role of BlackRock. Uh, to my mind, the fact that Black BlackRock uh, has been uh, made a sort of an official partner to the to Fed's interventions. It is now a sort of official partner to the European Commission's greening finance agenda. Is not only a signal a signal of the political power that uh, that shadow banks uh, have continued have amassed and are continue to to amassing, but it's also a sign of their ability to deploy this political power in order to insulate uh, their balance sheet from what would be in a market-based financial system that Milton Friedman would like to see. What would be the sort of normal changes in uh, risk and return, or uh, uh, that would mean for higher re for higher returns, you have to assume higher risks. In a sense, that that distribution is, um, or that pairing is being um, completely altered by the interventions of of the state, and that's something prob problematic. And what we have here, and this uh, takes me back to my. Um, uh, days of thinking about uh, the social contract between uh, the, the ba regulated banks and the state. And we know that uh, historically uh, banks were provided with backstops to, for the, some of their liabilities that we, we uh, hold as assets for their bank deposits. 
as part of a social contract where the state said, okay, I'm going to uh, backstop these liabilities, but in return, I want you to be properly regulated. And and this uh, political uh, uh, power of uh, Bl BlackRock and others is a form of creating a social contract where only one party, that is the state, uh, does things for for the other uh, party that is private finance. There are very few regulations that are, in a sense, exacting some uh, compromises and some trade-offs from from the shadow banking world for uh, in return for the state de-risking uh, their systemic liabilities. Thank you for that. Um, it's actually already four o'clock, but I'm gonna we're gonna go like two minutes over time. Um, oh no! Um, I want you to finish on um, maybe um, talk about what kind of space for action that exists for heterodox economists and people who want to, um, I would say, challenge this bleak uh, outlook we have at the moment uh, for the post-pandemic shadow bank takeover. Um, mm. so we'll have a couple of sentences of kind of where we go from here end this session off uh, I don't know I am uh, I I guess I was I think there are many sort of moving parts of this uh, of this political project and uh, and we need to be I thought for a while that we could mobilize and I guess the most uh, useful mobilization would be around a green new deal type of um, responses to um, the climate crisis but i'm not so sure anymore that uh, the green new deal is remains the kind of uh, imp sort of urgent and salient political project that we had before the pandemic so in a sense that is something that remains to be seen whether green if green recoveries will become um, politically uh, important for uh, uh, the global I guess for the global policy elite, then that's a space to mobilize because there uh, it's very easy to to make a case that uh, that shadow that systemic shadow banks or carbon financiers and they are making the rules uh, uh, by which the, their um, balance sheets will be greening. So mobili mobilizing around that is important. At the same time, I think uh, the, the heterodox economists have a, a responsibility, sort of moral responsibility in some ways, to to make more visible the ways in which uh, the the plumbing of market-based finance and market-based finance in general, uh, the plumbing is political and its ramifications go beyond, you know, some sort of exotic things that are happening to developing countries, but go very much into the basic social contract between the state and its citizens through uh, fiscal policy and through, um, I guess, to some extent, monetary policy. So it's a, it's in a sense a tall order because we need to understand the system to fight, uh, fight it and change it. But yeah, that's the only thing I can think of. Or, or we all stay indoors for a very long time and then everything is sorted because we can't, no, no, no capitalism can work without, uh, I don't know, some consumption. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you. Um, at least that's something to, to continue <laughs> with. Um, we'll end here. Uh, I'm just quickly going to say that we have our next session, um, the eighth session on Wednesday at 3 p.m. as well. Uh, where we'll be talking about contemporary pathogens and the food system. Um, the speaker will be Harun Akram Lodi, and the moderator will be Sarah Ansari. Um, thank you so much, Daniela, for this uh, very enlightening yet uh, depressing. My pleasure. <laughs> um, <laughs> and thank you to everyone who participated. I don't want it to be depressing, but no, the enemy is a very important part I mean, of the political struggle. <laughs> it's important. You have to call it as it is, I suppose. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.